At the first light of dawn on June 5, 1967, a deceptive calm hovered over the airfields of Israel. It was a day that would dramatically alter the course of Middle Eastern history. At 7.10 a.m. Israel time, an unexpected aerial maneuver began to unfold. 16 Magister Felga jets, relics of the 1950s French design, but now cunningly retrofitted with rockets, soared into the sky from the Hatsor airfield. The jets adopted a routine patrol formation, masking the true intent of their mission. Minutes later, the airfield buzzed again with escalating urgency. Aurigan bombers, the real vanguard of Israel's audacious plan, roared into the sky. They were swiftly joined by a squadron of sleek mirages from Ramat David and 15 formidable twin-engine Vatours from Hatzarim. By 7.30 a.m., the sky was a canvas of military might, with nearly 200 Israeli aircraft piercing the tranquility of the morning. This was not a routine training exercise, nor a defensive protocol. It was the opening act of a six-day war, a conflict that would redefine the power dynamics in the Middle East. In a bold and high-stakes gambit, Israel had launched a preemptive strike, a masterstroke of military aimed at gaining air superiority. The target? Egyptian airfields and the heart of their air force. As the world awoke, history held its breath. Within hours, the map of the Middle East would begin to be redrawn, and the reverberations of this day would echo for decades. This account chronicles the Six-Day War, a testament to strategic brilliance and the unpredictability of warfare. The outbreak of the war in 1967 may have shocked the world, but the tensions that led to it simmered for years. It all started with the 1956 Suez Crisis and the invasion of the United Kingdom, France, and Israel on Egypt after its president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, decided to nationalize the Suez Canal and close the adjacent Strait of Tehran for Israeli shipping. The crisis ended with Egypt consenting to deploying the United Nations Emergency Force, the UNEF, in the Sinai to ensure compliance with the 1949 armistice agreements. However, this certainly was no end to the crisis in the Middle East, as minor border clashes between Israel and its Arab neighbors, particularly Syria, persisted. In early November 1966, Syria and Egypt forced a mutual defense pact in fear of the Israelis developing the nuclear bomb. The idea of a preventative war to halt Israel's nuclear development has surfaced, particularly among the Egyptians. Simultaneously, Israel also contemplated military operations against its Arab neighbors out of fear of a surprise attack. Recalling the Rotem Crisis of 1916, a giant powder keg was set up and was only waiting for the proper spark to ignite it. What turned out to be an erroneous report given by the Soviets to Nasser about Israelis massing their troops in the Syrian border was what set the war in motion. In response to the report, Nasser amassed troops in the Sinai Peninsula, expelling the UNEF from Gaza and the Sinai and seizing their positions at Sharm el Sheikh, overlooking the Straits of Tehran. Israel reiterated its 1957 declarations, stating that another closure of the Straits would be considered as an act of war. Nonetheless, Nasser closed the Straits to Israeli shipping on May 22nd, 23rd. On May 30th, Jordan and Egypt signed a defense pact, with Iraq and Egypt deploying their troops and armored units in Jordan at Jordan's invitation. On June 1st, Israel formed a national unity government, and on June 4th, the decision was made to go to war. In 1967, upon full mobilization, the Israeli Defense Force, or the IDF, comprised approximately of 250,000 personnel, largely reservists, supported by conscripts and a smaller contingent of professional soldiers. Reservists served until age 50, with annual training or operational duties as required. The Army structure included 25 brigades, 9 armored, 2 mechanized, 10 infantry, partly mechanized, and 4 paratroop brigades, also serving as elite assault troops. These brigades, each roughly 4,500 strong, were diverse in composition, reflecting their specific roles. These brigades formed six division-sized task forces, or UGDAS, each tailored to their missions and operational areas. Notably, the Southern Command's three UGDAS in June of 1967 varied in composition, totaling 70,000 troops and around 800 tanks, including modern types. The Israeli Army's investment in modern communications enabled a flexible command and control system, facilitating initiatives at all levels. Confronting the Jordanian Army, the IDF's Central Command had a defensive orientation with Defensive Minister Moshe Dayan's strict orders precluding any provocation against Jordan. 
Its largest unit was the 16th Etzione Jerusalem Brigade. Other formations included the 4th Reserve Infantry Brigade and the 10th Harel Mechanized Brigade. Similarly, Northern Command's formation in the Jezreel Valley, including the 45th and 37th Armored Brigades and the 9th Reserve Infantry Brigade, were prepared defensively. Adhering to a defensive posture, Israeli forces were equipped primarily with Western origin weapons. The Air Force utilized mainly French aircraft, with Mirage 3 being the best plane in the fleet. Armored plane units featured British and American designs, such as the M50 and M51 Shermans, the M48A3 Pattons, and Centurions. Israeli infantrymen were armed with Belgian FN Fal assault rifles and FN Mag machine guns, but also with domestically produced weapons like the Uzi submachine gun. In June 1967, with an official strength of 210,000, the Egyptian army deployed approximately 100,000 troops in the Sinai Peninsula and 50,000 in Yemen, with the remainder being repositioned to protect Cairo west of the Suez Canal. Six divisions of 930 tanks, most being T-34-85 and T-55 tanks, 200 assault guns and 900 artillery pieces formed the formidable force of the Sinai Front Command. The Egyptian army was a mix of professional soldiers and conscripts undergoing three years of national service. Their ability to remain in prepared positions for extended periods, unlike the Israeli economy burdened by prolonged mobilization, made them defensively inclined. However, inadequate training and mechanization hampered their effectiveness. The officer corps was heavily politicized, affecting the professionalism of the army. Despite these challenges, individual soldiers displayed stoicism, though officers often neglected their welfare. The rigid command structure limited the initiative of regimental officers. The Jordanian army, under Egyptian General Abdul Munim Riyadh, was 55,000 strong, divided into eastern and western commands by the Jordan River. The bulk of Jordanian forces were deployed in the West Bank, primarily in Samaria and the south, strategically positioned along the eastern edge of the coastal lowlands bordering Israel. Jerusalem was defended by the 3rd Infantry Brigade, Reinforced by the 27th Brigade and Jericho Armored Forces were based in the Jordan Valley, with the 40th and 60th Armored Brigades in reserve. Additionally, Iraqi and Saudi forces were included in the Jordanian Army as part of the Unified Arab Command. Syria's army numbered 75,000 and was deployed along the Israeli border. The Golan Heights, a fortress with bunkers, pillboxes, and interlocking positions, had over 500 artillery pieces and 750 tanks and self-propelled guns. Three fortified lines, including artillery and Katyusha rocket batteries, constituted the Syrian defenses. Eight brigades held the field fortifications, with five infantry brigades in the front lines and three armored and mechanized brigades in reserve. The Iraqi 3rd Armored Division, Saudi Arabian Brigade, Syrian Brigade, and Iraqi aircraft were anticipated but never materialized. With 420 Soviet-built combat aircraft, Egypt possessed the largest and most modern Arab air force with most of the fleet consisting of MiG-21, MiG-19, and MiG-17 fighter planes. However, it was the Tu-16 Badger medium bombers that were of particular concern to Israel due to their devastating bombing capacity. Other Arab states reinforced their air forces, aided by volunteer pilots from the Pakistan Air Force. In their fleets, Soviet weaponry predominated, except for Jordan, which used Western aircraft such as Hawker Hunters. In examining the situation before the conflicts, it is evident that the Arab forces, in terms of sheer numbers, appeared to hold a significant advantage over Israel. However, despite their numerical strength, the Arab armies faced substantial challenges regarding operational efficiency and doctrinal coherence. A notable absence of political and military coordination among the involved Arab nations further compounded these issues. This lack of unity resulted in the absence of a unified strategy for a coordinated invasion of Israel. In a series of military operations, the Sinai Peninsula became the focal point of action. Operations in this area were marked by a strategic surprise orchestrated by the Israeli military. The campaign unfolded in two phases, an initial and devastating airstrike by the Israeli Air Force, IAF, followed by a well-coordinated ground offensive that culminated in the capture of Sinai. On the morning of June 5, 1967, the war operations began with Operation Mokt, a meticulously planned and brilliantly executed airstrike by the IAF. Flying across the Mediterranean Sea at low altitudes to evade radar detection, Israeli warplanes launched a surprise attack on the Egyptian airfields. This devastating blow effectively crippled the Egyptian Air Force. With 338 Egyptian aircraft destroyed, 
among them the entire fleet of 30 Tu-16 bombers. During the operation, Israeli bombers used specifically designed tarmac shredding penetration bombs to disable runways, thus further crippling their enemy. Ultimately, Operation Mokt secured air supremacy for Israel, a pivotal advantage that would shape the course of the war. Ultimately, Operation Mokt secured air supremacy for Israel, a pivotal advantage that would shape the course of the war. Subsequently, the Israeli Defense Forces embarked on a ground offensive across the Sinai Peninsula. During the Six-Day War, the Israelis made a significant departure from their past military strategies concerning Egypt by focusing their attack on the northern part of the peninsula. Unlike previous occasions where they attacked via the central and southern routes, the IDF's approach emphasized a three-pronged offensive, integrating infantry, armor, and air support bolstered by their newfound air dominance. In the northern sector, Major General Israel Tal led the charge through the challenging terrain of the Rafah Gap. His men encountered formidable Egyptian defenses, including minefields and entrenched gun emplacements. Despite stiff resistance, Israeli forces, leveraging their combined arms advantage, breached these defenses. The ensuing Battle of Rafah was a fierce contest, resulting in significant casualties on both sides. Advancing towards Arish, the Israeli forces faced intense combat, particularly in the Jiradi Defile, a narrow pass vigorously defended by Egyptian forces. Although Israeli troops incurred substantial casualties, they successfully secured Arish, a pivotal milestone in their offensive. Simultaneously, Brigadier General Avraham Yofe and Major General Ariel Sharon conducted operations south of Tal's forces. Yofe's division played a vital role in facilitating Tal's capture of strategic points. At the same time, Sharon's troops encountered formidable resistance at the Um Katef Plateau, a heavily fortified Egyptian position defending the vital Abu Agela Road Junction. Battles in the southern sector were characterized by intense fighting, with the Israelis ultimately emerging victorious. The turning point of the Sinai campaign came with the Egyptian decision to withdraw from Sinai after the fall of Abu Agela. This hasty retreat was very poorly coordinated and executed chaotically, leading to significant personnel and equipment losses. The disarray during this withdrawal provided the Israeli forces with the opportunity to inflict further damage and extend their territorial gains. While Egyptian units displayed bravery and resilience in fixed defensive positions, their ability to adapt to the fluid nature of mobile warfare was very limited. In contrast, the Israeli forces showcased a higher degree of flexibility and tactical acumen, often outmaneuvering their opponents and capitalizing on weaknesses in the Egyptian defensive setup. By June 8th, Israel had completed the capture of the entire Sinai Peninsula, achieving a decisive victory in the war. This rapid and overwhelming success underscored the effectiveness of Israeli's military strategy, which combined air superiority, agile ground tactics, and a well-coordinated combined arms approach. Since the Israelis focused on conducting a campaign against Egypt, they initially planned a defensive stance along the Jordanian front. However, intermittent skirmishes in Jerusalem quickly escalated into full-scale confrontation. The Jordanian forces, well-disciplined and trained primarily by the British, engaged in the initial shelling of Israeli positions on June 5th, which was met with a swift and robust Israeli response on the same day. This included a quick and efficient counteroffensive in which the Israeli Air Force played a crucial role targeting Jordanian and Iraqi air bases, thus significantly reducing the threat posed by enemy aircraft. The epicenter of intense fighting was the city of Jerusalem, laden with historical and religious significance for both Jews and Arabs. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, Jordanian forces mounted a valiant defense. The battle was marked by strategic maneuvers, with Israeli forces gradually advancing through the city amid heavy resistance. Key confrontations included the battles for Government House, Jabal Muqabar, and Ammunition Hill the latter being a pivotal turning point. Already on the second day of the battle, the Jordanians realized that they could not withhold Israeli assaults. Amidst the chaos, an Egyptian directive ordered Jordanian withdrawal, a command initially resisted by King Hussein in hopes of a ceasefire. Miscommunication and disorder within Jordanian ranks led to gradual and disorganized retreat. The Israeli military, leveraging air superiority and combined arms tactics, effectively pursued retreating Jordanian units, exacerbating their disarray. The conflict reached a critical moment with the Israeli decision to capture the old city of Jerusalem on June 7th. Led by paratroopers and met with minimal resistance, this operation symbolized a significant victory for Israel and a profound loss for Jordan. The northern part of the West Bank also witnessed significant battles, with Israeli forces overcoming Jordanian defenses in Samaria and the town of Jenin. 
The war exposed vulnerabilities in Jordan's military strategy, marked by inadequate preparation and coordination. By the end of the conflict, Israel had almost total control of the West Bank, beginning its military occupation. The brief but intense conflict resulted in considerable casualties and a seismic shift in the Middle East geopolitical dynamics. For Israel, the victory in the West Bank expanded its territorial control, while for Jordan, it was a devastating blow to its military presence and national identity. At the outbreak of the war, the Syrians opted to take a restrained approach. However, after Syrians received inaccurate reports of Egyptian successes in Sinai, they launched a series of air assaults on Israeli targets. These efforts, targeting locations like the Haifa oil refinery and Megiddo airfield, were largely ineffective. Quite contrary, Israel's swift and decisive air counterattack devastated Syrian air bases, crippling the Syrian air force by destroying a significant portion of its combat aircraft, including nearly half of its MiG-21 fleet. Following these air engagements, a period of intermittent artillery exchanges ensued. Syrian artillery barrages targeted Israeli settlements, prompting Israeli counterfire. This exchange set the stage for the ground operations to follow. Despite a minor Syrian ground offensive targeting Israeli water plants on June 6th, the attack was quickly repelled by Israeli forces, leading to considerable Syrian casualties and a loss of equipment. With the conflict in the northern sector escalating beyond original plans, the Israeli leadership decided to respond to the situation with an all-out offensive on the capture of the Golan Heights. Considering the challenging terrain, the Israeli offensive in the Golan Heights was meticulously planned. Israel chose to attack the less fortified northern flank of the Syrian defenses, an unexpected move that caught Syrian forces off guard. Intense air campaigns preceded the ground assault, with Israeli ground forces breaching Syrian minefields and advancing into enemy territory on June 9th. In the ensuing operations, Syrian forces exhibited a lack of tactical flexibility, remaining largely static and unable to adapt to the rapidly evolving battlefield, allowing Israeli forces to exploit weaknesses in their defensive positions. Despite fierce resistance, the lack of a unified Syrian command structure and ineffective response strategy was very evident. By the end of the first day, Israeli forces had made significant territorial gains. As the Israeli military received reinforcements on June 10th, their advance continued capitalizing on the absence of an effective Syrian counterattack. The relentless Israeli assault eventually shattered Syrian defenses, with secondary defenses posing a continued challenge. The conflict culminated in a ceasefire brokered by the United Nations, marking Israelis' control over the Golan Heights and a strategic victory. The Arab nations showed disunity even in times of defeat. Facing a total defeat, Egypt and Jordan agreed to a ceasefire on June 2nd, while Syria continued to fight for another day. Ultimately, they too accepted a ceasefire on June 9th, and they signed it on June 11th. After only six days of combat operations, Israel had seized both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and they had expanded their control over the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights. The territorial expansion improved their strategic position and defense capabilities in potential conflicts with Arab countries. On the other hand, it also brought under their control more than one million extremely hostile Arabs. However, once again, hundreds of thousands of Arabs fled the territories that the IDF invaded. All things considered, the war's outcome was a decisive Israeli victory, with the geopolitical landscape of the Middle East dramatically altered. However, the war brought no permanent peace to that region. Instead, its aftermath set the stage for future conflicts, including the Yom Kippur War six years later. Thank you so much for watching this episode, and if you want to see more from the Militology channel, please like, share, subscribe, you know the deal. Hit the bell icon to be notified for our next video. Stay tuned!